So section I is all about disclosures. Um, some of them are going to be just basically general disclosures, and that'll be from I six, <clears throat> I six to I six L. But um, we need we need to like I really want to have you drill down on uh, as well as obligations to disclose because this is like a hot topic. And um, I know that we've been going round and round in the forms committee meeting this last Friday on what to leave in and what to leave out and what constitutes disclosure or automatic updates to the disclosure statement. So um, who would like to go and uh, start off reading? Why don't we start? I won. This, wait, wait, I know you're, you have a very unique name and I, re I forgot it though. Uh, wait, wait. <laughs> I didn't write it down. It's not time. Pam, right? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Remind me. Sunny? Summer? Sunshine. 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 Okay, sunshine. Yes. Seller's obligation to disclose. A. Disclosure of material costs. Pursuant to Hawaii Revised Statute Chapter 508D, for the sale of residential real property, which means be simple or be sold real property on which currently is situated, one, from one to four dwelling units, or two, a residential condominium or cooperative apartment, the primary use of which is occupancy as a residence, and oh, oh, I, Mm -hmm. And no, under that's common good. law, yep. sorry, but I <clears throat> seller is obligated to fully and accurately disclose in writing to buyer any fact, defect, or condition, past or present, that would be expected to measurably affect the value of the property to a reasonable person. A material fact. Seller acknowledges and agrees that the disclosure requirements under Chapter 508D are in addition to other disclosure obligations of seller required by law relating to the sale of real property. Okay, why don't you go ahead and underline a material fact. And there's um there's some exceptions to 508D and they're not covered in here, but I will be sure, and I, I didn't realize that there is a huge 508D section <laughs> that we went over on Friday with the um with HAR. So I'm gonna try and get my hands on that. Um just so we all know what what the exclusions are for 508 D. You know the other thing about this section is 508 D. So HRS 508 D. You guys all know that that's a state law. Right. So when a seller is saying let's say that they're reluctant or they're kind of hedging on what they want to disclose or how they want to disclose it, you know, let them know this is a law. This is not a request. This is a requirement that they fully disclose all material facts. And so make sure that you guys can clearly explain what a material fact is when doing the seller disclosure. How would you describe it? Just I'd read what it says. Okay. Yeah. Just, just okay. Yeah. So, and give examples, right? So, because uh, it's always better to disclose because as long as the yeah. buyer knows up front, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, because there may be there may be things there may be issues with the house that the seller doesn't really know, but as long as they file a disclosure statement, if there's something in there that the buyer has questions on, then they can investigate a little bit further. But you know, if there's like a hole in the ceiling, you don't disclose it. I mean, it's pretty obvious. Mm -hmm. But if they go up in the attic and find that there's like, you know, some termite damage, well, the owners may not know that. He may not know certain things that are located underneath the house, right? Yeah. If it's an above uh, on post and piers. But, you know, the buyer feels a lot better if it's uh, disclosed and knows about it as opposed to finding it out at a later time. Yeah. So a couple comments on that. One is, you want to fully disclose and you want to have as much as possible the buyers um, knowing about the disclosures, especially if it's a significant disclosure before they su submit a, an offer, if possible, because then they submit that number with the full understanding of that property. Versus later, right? 
they find out about it and then now they want to either cancel or uh, reduce their price significantly. So I think to me, it's a better route to take if they fully are fully aware of what they're buying uh, to the best of their ability at that time because they haven't done their home inspection yet. But they're aware that maybe there's been some shifting or, or that it maybe has been a past leak. So as one of the best practices that we would do when we have a listing is um, if I'm helping the seller and it's gonna be the seller's responsibility, not mine, but I am gonna go through the house and look at it with my own eyes. I look at the ceiling, I look under the house, you know, like an inspector would. And then I'd ask them questions. So I'd make notes. So let, let's say that I see a little brown spot and we're going through like water, right? Has there been any past leaks? And they say nothing. Then I'll ask them, I noticed that there was a water spot in the bedroom. What do you know about that? And they might say, well, I, I, I bought it like that or, you know, whatever it is. Because sometimes sellers don't remember what happened or they fail to think about it when they read that question. Because it may be thinking more recent versus past. And it says, right, anything past or present. And it could be good or bad. So it could be a leak or it could be a new appliance that was recently upgraded that you will still want to disclose. It doesn't have to all be negative things. You know, and then if you're inspecting the property or you're going, you're doing a visual check like Kent does, I do it. And I know that, you know, most everybody does it. But if you see things there, you know, point them out to the seller because he may not, he may not see it. And he may not want to disclose it, but you have a uh, mm. you have an mm -hmm. obligation to disclose it. You'll be held as as much liable as the seller would. Yeah, and it says it in there. I don't know where it says it, but it does say that um, it is your responsibility. If you're aware of something, you got to disclose it, even though your client says no. You are obligated to disclose it. So I have a question: like, as a new agent, where if you are going to put an offer on a home? Where is all this like seller disclosure found? Yep. It's usually once you get into contract. Okay. Um, but what I like to do, especially if the house is in really bad shape, I'd like to put the disclosure statement in um in supplemental data in the MLS so that they can pull it up. Um, I may have a client that's an out of town owner and hasn't seen the property in 15 years and has been managed by his brother who's a schmuck. So I will have them do a home inspection and I would have the home inspection, you know, posted in MLS as well, just so that, you know, buyer beware kind of thing. Yep. Thank you. Because the, la the last thing you want to do is to get on the contract and then surprise a buyer with all these issues that are wrong. Right. And then he's just going to like, after two weeks or after a week, he's going to go ahead and cancel. So you might as well just like weed all those people out. Okay. Yeah. So put it in the um, the notes section, right? In MLS so that, and then you can refer to it in notes of the MLS. Itself. Yeah. And then you just, like, just have all the supplemental data. And then the other thing that uh, we try to do is when we open escrow. So let's say we accept an offer. We shoot back everything that we could have possibly have to start the clock as the listing agent, right? Mm -hmm. Survey seller's disclosure, you know, whatever makes sense at that time, mm -hmm. shoot it back to them so that the clock starts yeah. with opening escrow. Okay. Yeah, so if you have a listing, it's your listing, get the property disclosure statement completed before it goes on the market. Yeah. Because as soon as you're gonna accept the contract in, you just send everything off the prelim title report, start the clock ticking as quickly as possible on timelines. Because if the buyer's gonna drop out, you want it to drop out early. And not to belabor it, but the other reason why you want to do the seller's disclosure before you go on the market is you as an agent, you learn more about the property. And then you take this from the price. Yeah. Well, so all that comes into play, right? The more you know, the better you can communicate and negotiate on behalf of the seller. So it, I've seen it the other way where sellers, agents do the disclosure after accepting an offer, and which doesn't make sense, any sense to me at all, but I've seen people do that. Sunshine, would you uh, take B as well? Mandatory provision of disclosure statement. Unless, unless exempt in Hawaii Revised Statutes Chapter 508D, no later than blank days 
10 days of left blank. After the acceptance date, seller shall provide buyer with a disclosure statement, a written statement prepared by seller or at seller's direction, signed and dated by seller within six months before or 10 days after the acceptance date. Such disclosure statement shall be prepared in good faith and with due care and shall disclose all material facts relating to the property that I or one are within the knowledge or control of seller two can be observed from visible accessible areas but three are required to be disclosed under section 508d-4.5 and section 508d-15 of the public revised statutes pursuant to section 508d-9 in good faith and with due care includes honesty in fact in the investigation, research, and preparation of the disclosure statement, and may include information on the following. One, facts based on only seller's personal knowledge. Two, facts provided to seller by governmental agencies and departments. Three, existing reports prepared for seller by third-party consultants, including with limitation A, Licensed engineer, two land surveyor, three geologists, four wood destroying insect control expert, five or contractor or other home inspection expert. Dealing with matters within the scope of the professional's license or expertise for the purpose of the disclosure statement. Um, four, Facts provided to seller by a managing agent of a homeowner's association, including without limitation, a condominium, cooperative, or community association. Buyer acknowledges that the disclosure statement is not a warranty of any kind. Pursuant to Chapter 508D, the disclosure statement shall not be construed as a substitute for any expert inspection professional advice or warranty that buyer may wish to obtain. So in the first line of B, unless unless exempt, there's like, I think there's four cases. I want to say if it's like a buyer and a seller that's selling it on their own with with no no realtors, right? Like if I'm buying your property. Hmm. Or you you're mean like a quick claim deed or something like that? Um. Like I'm not obligated to provide you with a disclosure statement if I I'm if you're buying sure. my house and there's no realtors involved. Okay, I, I don't know. I think if it's a foreclosure, pretty sure it's a foreclosure. If you're buying a bank owned property, they're gonna cross that off, and you're gonna see like a whole uh, an amendment to the con addendum to the contract that's, that states everything that they don't know about the property. And there's one more. It may be like a probate situation where um someone's passed away and the court has appointed a an estate administrator. Who would absolutely know nothing about mm -hmm. the property? So I just I'm going through that right now. Okay. Um, I like to give, I like to give ten days, especially if it's a single family home. If there are some issues in the disclosure statement where the buyer is going to have to get, you know, some experts out there, say um, there's some shifting soil, you may want to have a soils engineer. If there's uh, some issues with the foundation, you're going to want to have a contractor come out. But I see a lot of timelines, you know, really, really short. And it just doesn't, you know, they're saying, oh, well, the buyer can read it. Well, yeah, I can read something in 24 hours, but it doesn't mean I can investigate the issues that are wrong with the house. So always give your buyer enough time. And the market is not really moving that fast anymore where there's like multiple offers and you have to waive all your buyer's rights. So that's for what? Um, that's not for I1B, right? No, that's, this is that's just, for seller. Yeah. Because when you look at, if, if the question is how, how much time do you want to give seller to provide the seller's disclosure? So if you look at, you always have to look at these things from both the buyer's perspective separately from the seller's perspective. So from the buyer's perspective, you might want it sooner than later uh, because your home inspector may want to see it. Or you may want to do um, 
somebody who is more specialized, like a, um, a soils engineer, if you find that maybe there's been some shifting going on. So as a buyer, you probably want it really. Yeah. So let me take that back to Ken's point. To answer your question for B, I, if I'm representing the buyer, I want it as soon as possible. And I'm going to put a short deadline in there, like two days. Yeah. I want it. I want to get it done before the J1 inspection is done because yeah. the inspector does want to see it. And as a seller, you also want it early because whatever that clock is for the amount of time that the buyer has to review and accept or reject based on the based on what was provided to them, it just leaves that window of, of, of cancellation open longer, right? So if you take the full 10 days as a seller and then give it to them on the 10th day, and let's say you only give them seven days to accept or reject the contract based on the disclosure, then that's 17 days into the contract. So um, as a buyer, you might also, the flip side of the buyer is, okay, you want it early for the inspection, for inspection purposes, but if you get it late, at least it gives you more time to cancel if you find something that you don't like about the property. So take your pick on that. Okay, I'm sorry, we haven't met. What Kyle. is your name? Kyle. 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 Okay, Kyle. Why don't you? Oh, you know what we had everyone do is introduce themselves, but oh, you, you weren't here. I'm Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> How long have you been an agent, Kyle? Um, started January. Oh, Daniel. Okay. Yeah, what were you doing is. prior to this? Um, I was at H and and then I hated it, and <laughs> I came here to uh, do real estate. So awesome. Yeah. Welcome. Welcome. Oh, welcome. Breath of fresh air. Any any escrows so far? No. Okay. Not yet. Uh, I too. Yes. Uh, amended disclosure statement. Uh, pursuant to Chapter Five Hundred Eight B, seller is obligated to provide an amended disclosure statement upon later discovered information. If after seller delivers a disclosure statement to buyer and prior to closing, seller becomes aware of information that was not previously discovered or disclosed, or that makes any statement in the disclosure statement inaccurate, and said information directly, substantially, and adversely affects the value of the property, then seller shall provide an amended disclosure statement to buyer within blank days or 10 days if left. After the seller's discovery of the non-disclosure or inaccuracy, and in any event, by no later than 12 noon of the last business day prior to the recorded sale. Okay, there's a lot you probably want to talk about. That. Yeah, so I think like this is one of the paragraphs that are that's going to have to be rewritten because what normally happens is that if I'm the seller, buyer does their inspection and they find issues with the house and they don't tell me, then I have no knowledge to update the amended disclosure statement. So it used to be like, okay, my buyer knows about this during the inspection, but we're going to wait for the seller to do an amended disclosure statement. They can drag that on and on and on and on. Um, so I think it's going to be written that, you know, in the event that buyer later discovers, they have to notify the seller immediately so that the seller can do an amended disclosure statement because the law is pretty clear. If the buyer does it, the seller has to amend the disclosure statement, but the seller needs to know about what the discrepancies were. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there are, okay, so as a buyer, right, you, you do your home inspection. Um, and let's say that you have one of the companies that, that says anything found during a home inspection is an automatic disclosure. Automatic update. Automatic update. See, that's okay, not so, that's not going to be good anymore. Yeah. Oh, as of when? It's it's against the law. Oh, that is not a legal thing. Yeah. So a lot of people put in the amendment, like you get another broker's contract, and in their uh, uh their standard addendum, it'll say any discovery by buyer is an automatic update to the disclosure statement. Well, it's not. Because that's okay. 508D is really clear on that. Okay. I just learned that on Friday. Okay. So as a buyer's agent, then you get your home inspection done, or you just happen to be there for something, and you, you see notice that uh there's a there's something that needs to be disclosed because it was not disclosed. So how do you handle that, Tony? What do you do? I'm representing the buyer. Your buyer. Your buyer's agent. Uh because you gotta uh, do something, otherwise the seller knows nothing about the disclosure, right? Yeah, so what I would do is I would um probably drag it out 
and then notify the seller on day nine? Well, it depends on what I it depends on what I wrote down in I two. I would drag it out for as long as I can. Then I would update this. Then I would let the seller know, and then his time frame is going to start ticking again in I four. Yep. Because you might have an issue like the guy, you know, the plumber comes and he scopes the pipes and all of a sudden you've got like 200 feet of sewer line. That's no good. And if your buyer wants to go through with it, he needs to know what the repair costs are going to be or replacement costs. So you can ask the seller for a credit. So all of that doesn't, you know, all of that takes a lot of time. So, but I think it says for, just, we want to be clear about these things because it, it matters, right? Under I-4, it says upon discovery, not upon notification, that your clock starts. Yeah, so there's a lot of uh, gray. There's a lot of gray area over here, and it can be argued on both sides. Really? So if I do a home inspection, I found the cracked pipe. I, I don't notify for 10 days from the date that I discover it. Where my, and let's say I have seven days upon later discovered. How mm -hmm. many days do I really have? Did, did I pass it already because I waited nine days? Because it says upon discovery. Right. So, but the seller still has to provide you with an updated disclosure statement. Yeah. So you notify right away. No, I would wait. I drag wait? it out and I would argue over it. <laughs> I mean, I would because it's 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 very unclear. Why would you wait? Can you try it again? Um. Okay. I would wait because if I know about it and I don't tell the seller right away, it gives me extra time to investigate. Mm -hmm. And then when I tell the seller about it, they have to do an amended disclosure statement, which buys me more time. What, what, and the okay. contract is very gray in, in, in section I-4. Okay, so let's say that it's, I can understand if it's a, something that needs further investigation. Mm -hmm. So I investigate, and then once, I de once I'm told by an expert, that it is an issue and I do feel it's a a new disclosure, then sure. But if it's like very clear that it's a it's it's a material fact. And yeah, it's a material no, fact. no more investigation is needed, would you still wait? I would wait because I not only would I want to investigate, but I want to know how much it's going to cost. Okay. Right? Okay. So I can say, oh, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, you know, we found out there's a cracked pipe and this is how much it's going to cost. Now, I let them know that I discovered it. I let them know what the cost is. And now they need to update the disclosure statement. Totally. Yes. Don't you get, after you update the disclosure statement, um, again, More things. X amount of days to approve yeah. it because now the disclosure statement is not approved. Right. Right. Yeah, that's I three. Yeah, that's that's in I three. I four. No, I four is oh I I three. Inaccurate, right? I three is it's really confusing updated. section I. People pay attention. Yeah. <laughs> As you can tell, Kent and I <laughs> are confused. Um yeah, it's really how you read it. And you take the time and they and you don't even have time to get them to fix it before you're supposed to call it. Well, it's not necessarily about fixing it. It's about going back to the bargaining table and negotiating. You're not really asking for a repair. You could be asking for a repair, or it may be so much damage that you just don't even want to buy the home any longer. Yeah. Or you're going to say, like, I'll buy the house, but I want $75,000 credit because I know that I'm going to fix it the way it should be fixed. And not have the seller do and get a quote for like thirty thousand, and then you know, then you don't really know what kind of work you're getting. Yeah. So regardless of which route you take, right? You you disclose it, you notify the other side right away, or you delay it. Make sure you know your dates, because if you get confused on your dates, you may run out of time. A quick question. I know we're not there yet, but I feel like it's relevant for like so when they do the J one inspection. If you find something and the seller requires that data that for PDF or the seller disclosure, that's what they're talking about. Yeah, if it's a material yeah. fact, they yeah. should. They should. So they yeah. And, you know, the other, I don't know if this is a side note, but it's, I think it, it comes up from time to time where I'm arguing with the other agent about a new disclosure. 
because they don't feel that they want to dis up, they don't want to ask the seller to update it. So I'm telling the other agent, this is not for the seller, and it's it's actually for all parties involved, not only the seller and the buyer, but for us as agents. Because if they don't update that disclosure, and then buyer down the road says, hey, they never disclosed it. It's not on the seller's disclosure. They're not only going to sue seller, they're going to sue you and me as well. They're going to, we're all going to get involved in this, and we don't want that. So just update the seller's disclosure. So simple. Not a big deal. So just be aware of that. Some guys may push back at you. So that's why depending on, you know, depending on the size of the property, like when I see... I'll give you an example. Um, we had a contract written. Buyer buyer waves J one. Right, zero days, and I said, "Don't do that." Oh, the buyer is going to wave J one. Well, then issues came up during the final walkthrough, and I said, "We well, don't have a case. You wave J one. You have no idea what the condition of the property was." during a J1 inspection, so you can't ask for anything during J3. And so it's things like that. If you've got a single family home, always ask for 15 days. If you're like on high-end properties, you know, several million, ask for 30, ask for 45. <clears throat> because with properties that big, it's a home inspection, it's an AC system, it's a roof, it's a contractor to come in and check everything. Because the last thing you want to do is to get sued at the end of a transaction and have some whopping bill for like a couple hundred thousand dollars in fees. According, so to, according to Chemo, do you, do you all know probably the top two most um, litigated issues when it comes to disclosures? What are the top two things that pop up when it comes to disclosures or lack of disclosure? What is... Um, water because of shifting mm -hmm. and then i think the other is mold yeah i think those are the top two so water is bad water yeah water yeah if you have water damage yeah if i'm a straggler <laughs> hey it's you being bad? <laughs> <laughs> this is your time out <laughs> gotta attend the class she went on vacation she forgot she forgot what the contract was all about i'm getting in there Yes. <laughs> well, if you have, you know, if there's been a leak, okay, right? Like you want some time to investigate to see if there's any mold, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to tell you a situation that are that happened after closing. Um, buyers moved in a week later. There was a water leak, and. Um, they have a contractor come in, opens up the wall, and the seller had wrapped a cloth around a leaky pipe and, stu <laughs> and stuck a bucket and then resealed up. Yeah. And it's then <laughs> and then and put a bucket in so that the leak wouldn't show up for like a couple of weeks. Um oh but you know, the water uh, the floor got damaged because it took a time, it took a little while for the for the leak to show up, and then they had mold issues. You know, so water is a big problem, especially with mold. So what happened? Uh, litigation. Yeah. I got caught talking. <laughs> <hand in. laughs> I mean, oh boy. And they say, oh, we didn't know about the leak. Like, how can you not, <laughs> how can you not know about the leak? Because there's a bucket in there and there's a rag, <laughs> you know? <laughs> oh, God. Disclosure required for tap water, which is not great, for example, you buy the one. Um, you know, I had some clients that were buying a house um in Manoa and they were concerned about the kind of piping. So I think they had their water tested. Mm -hmm. But you know, unless the seller tests their water, they don't really know, you know, what's in it. But by the way, it's kind of it's what's available, it's what's available to the seller. I mean, you know, if the seller and his whole family are all sick and dying because they got bad water, then that's a disclosure, right? But okay. If you're just drinking your tap water every single day and you're you feel fine, yeah. yeah. And how many days would you have here in I two? Um, I would ask. I would ask for ten days. If I'm re representing the buyer, I'm going to ask for the max. Because it's better to ask for the max 
and have adequate time than to find out that you don't have enough time and ask for an extension that the seller doesn't have to grant you. And then your buyer's out, you know, money for the inspections. If he's got a pool inspector or a roof inspector, like all that, you know, all that costs money. Well, I mean, like dumb question, but it says left blank, it's 10 days. Can you yeah. just leave it blank if you want 10 days or do you always just fill it out? Um, I would always fill it out. Yeah. Or some or some some people leave it blank because they're gonna ask for 10 days, but then it's you only allow 10 days. If you need 15 days, like you leave it blank, you'll short yourself, you know, shorten your buyer five days. Yeah. And I think it used to be 15 days before. <laughs> okay, Absalom, why don't you take uh where do we leave? So I three? I three. I Okay. Upon receipt of the disclosure statement or amending disclosure statement, provided pursuant to paragraphs I1 or I2, buyer shall provide seller with a written acknowledgement or pitch within days after receipt. Okay, so that's that's like the seller gives the buyer the disclosure statement and the buyer is only acknowledging that he received it doesn't have anything to do with reviewing it. It's just that, hey, I received it. Um, I, you know, like two days. Okay. Upon receipt of the disclosure statement provided pursuant to paragraph I1, buyer should have days or 15 days of left blank to examine the disclosure statement and to resign this purchase contract. Okay, so that's the, I've got the disclosure statement and now I've got 15 days to review it. I can either, um, I can either approve it, I can go through with the transaction, I can cancel the transaction, or I can just say, hey, based on this, I'm going to want a credit. So anytime you're trying to negotiate something, always do it within the time frame of the contingency, right? J1 inspection, if there are problems with, with the property, negotiate whatever it is that you're looking for before the last day. Don't do the inspection on the last day and then try and get something negotiated because the seller doesn't have to respond. And if you're the buyer and you don't pull the plug and cancel transaction, then it means that you're moving forward. So that's the other reason why I don't like short time frames because it doesn't give the buyer enough time to make good solid, you know, decision on what they what they want to do. See, upon receipt of an amendment disclosure statement, buyer should have Days or 15 days to flat plane to examine the amended disclosure statement and to send the purchase plan. Okay, so that means seller, seller update. I tell the I tell the seller something's wrong with the property. They up they amend the disclosure statement, and I've got 15 days, 10 days, or 20 days, whatever it is that we put in there. D, uh, should buy a letter to resign this purchase contract pursuant to subparagraphs B or C, buyer must give seller or seller's agent legal notice of such rescission within the specified time period and the termination provisions of paragraph 2 shall apply. Okay. Any questions on that? <clears throat> so as a buyer's agent, when you get your seller's disclosure statement, from the seller, first thing I do is I shoot it off to the buyer, right? Please review, let me know if you have any questions. And then in the meantime, I'm looking at that as well. I'm trying to see any questions that come to my mind. So one is, have they filled this thing out properly? I had one where it was, you get all kinds, some that are done really well, and others that are just, they, they gave no guidance to the seller. None of the boxes were checked. They were saying NA to things that you had to say yes, no, or I don't know, but they were going NA on all these things. I'm like, this is ridiculous. Talk to the broker saying, you got to fix this. This is not acceptable, you know? So review it and then um, have your buyer email you questions. And then you can then tell them what you saw and ask if it's okay for you to ask those questions and consolidate and send it to the seller for clarification. And, and as Tony said, right, don't wait. Because 
you may find something that appeared to be really tiny because be aware now, some of these agents, they're tricky. They're going to imply things. They won't be very specific or very clear. They'll imply it so that if it ever comes up, it's like, well, no, it's, it was disclosed. Maybe not very clearly. So now the responsibility is back on buyer to say, well, buyer, you should have asked my questions. If you were uncertain about that, you should have asked my questions. You don't want to be caught in that situation. It's going to be very uncomfortable. Yeah. So if the buyer decides to attend, is there a certain form or just? I would just email. email. Email cancellation. Yep. And if they say, tell me why, then I would say. Um, so your property's crap. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> the agent sucks. Uh, be because of um, disclosure. Disclosure. Yeah. And if you want, just pick out that specific area and then shoot it back. Because nowhere in here does it say you have to say why. It just says you have the right to. So never say why. If you don't have a reason why, don't say why. If you have a reason why, then you really detail it. Because if they resell to somebody else and they don't disclose and they get sued, they're going to come back to you and want to know why you canceled. And what? And then you should say, yeah, here's the email I gave them. Oh. But, then, but you're not you're not liable for that. No, you're not. Okay. No, you're not. Okay. Well, some agents want to know. Others don't. Yeah. Stuff comes up during the inspection, and then you want another disclosure statement. Like, can you redisclose this? And then the listing agent kind of just like ignores that request. We just talked about that, right? Remember, I just said that exact same thing. Yeah. But you discovered it, right? Yeah, but then like if you like, like mm -hmm. it's another disclosure, mm -hmm. and you kind of just send like, oh, and then they never send it. Mm -hmm. But for like for new like for new stuff that popped up during during the inspection or stuff that was already in the disclosure. It wasn't in the disclosure. Yeah. Like, it's disclosure. common. Yeah. But then what do you do? If they oh, you force them to. Just say it's just say it's the law. Just say it's five oh eight D, it's the law. Let your sellers know that it's the law. And you know what hits home for them to me is when I tell them this is not this is to protect us. Understand, this is to protect us. Because if either party sues, if, if the buyer ends up suing seller, you get pulled in and so do I. It doesn't make sense not to disclose. So when I say that, then it kind of resonates with them. When I go, oh, good point. Okay, I'll work on it. So question about like doing a re-disclosure statement. So if you're the listing agent, you have that form already pulled out and you just add whatever the new thing is and then resend it, or are you just adding the new portion? I like to do a blank disclosure statement and just say um, updated and just whatever one I'm, whichever it is that I'm updating, okay. you know, have my clients do that. What I've done is I've taken the first one and then I've, I've Xeroxed it and then I've updated the the Xerox copy and then I've said update number one with a date and the initial next to all the changes so you have now two because sometimes it's confusing right what is, what is really the update here so I just have another and then I go through second I go three or I just keep going if I have to or if you have a report mm -hmm. you can attach that report and that would be um, revision one so you have the main disclosure and then the report on top of that. But try and make it very clear. Um, so at um, least it, the, the buyer can follow. With regards to filling out the um, disclosure statement, I also always stress that my clients do not handwrite anything in those little lines because out of 100 people, you find 90 out of <laughs> Right. Well, handwriting. Mm -hmm. So I would say put in there C appendix A yep. and then have them type it yep. just a regular list. Yep. And so you actually give a disclosure that someone can read, right. yep. which also protects you. You don't want someone to think, oh, yeah, they read something there that wasn't there. Right. 
Yeah, I think they were looking at having the disclosure statement as like as a fillable PDF. Mm -hmm. And then the argument was, we don't really know who filled it out. It could have been the agent, right? So at least it's got, at least at the first four pages or five pages or most of it is handwritten with the exception of the issues that are with the house that need some explanation. You can kind of tell that the seller did it. And so, you can put all this in the, um, in the signature section, have a disclosure that says this is has been yeah. So, yeah, like I'm Donald Trump and I approve this message, right. that kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> so, you, is it okay to put, to have them fill out, you know, pages, all pages, one to five, and then in that um, that section where you, you write down if it's yes, you, you clarify, right? Mm -hmm. And you say see attached. And then as the agent, especially with older clients, they tell you the response and you type it and then you say you attach it so I'll say see attachment one so you leave that as attachment one type out all the responses have them sign that is that okay I would rather have a family member do it so you wouldn't but even want to type it I wouldn't want to type it okay. yeah okay because they're going to say who typed it yeah, you know because sometimes so cells, cells have short memory when they're in trouble oh oh I never said that absolutely yeah, yeah. But all, even old people these days can type. Yeah. No, no, no. Hey, if my mom, <laughs> if, my, if, if my mom can text at eighty-five, I know people can type. Okay. Um, five four. Buyers' rights and obligations upon later discovered inaccurate information. Upon discovery by buyer that the disclosure statement or amended disclosure statement fails to disclose a material fact or contains an inaccurate assertion that directly, substantially, and adversely affects the value of the property, and if buyer was not aware of the foregoing failure or inaccuracy, buyer may elect to send his purchase contract within the earlier to occur of either A, 15 days of the discovery by buyer of the failure or inaccurate or inaccuracy, or by B, left blank for 15 days of left blank of the receipt of the amended disclosure statement correcting the failure or inaccuracy. If buyer elects to rescind this purchase contract, buyer must give seller or seller's agent written notice of such precision within the specified time period and the termination provision of paragraph. 02 shall apply. This paragraph does not change seller's obligations under paragraph 52. Okay, so remember I talked about how you drag it out in uh, in I2, like if you discover something, you wait until you have all of your uh your quotes for whatever repairs that you need to have done. This is pretty much the reason why. Because I discovered it, now I let the seller know and it's either 15 days from the date of discovery or X amount of days from when I see an amended disclosure statement. Now, <clears throat> if you're like Kent and representing the seller and you show up at the home inspection, he's listening for all of the stuff that has to be redisclosed. He tells the seller to go ahead and redo the disclosure statement and then if you get a disclosure statement in I-4B and say I-4B is only two days, like the buyer's only got two days at that point to make a decision. So if you find something, so if you discover something during J-1 and you tell the seller right away and they do it, they update it. And it's only, if it's only two days, you don't even have enough time to do the disclosure statement by the time J-1 inspection is done. So be really careful when you're doing these dates mm -hmm. on the contract when you're representing the buyer. If you're the seller, you want the you want the time frame, you know, a little a little short. Yeah. You yeah. know, and, and normally, like if it's a, if it's a real serious problem and the buyer is really interested, you know, they'll give an extension for the buyer to do their due diligence. And if not, then you know you have to tell your buyer to walk. Yes. So notice there's two two different. Uh, types of dates, right? One is for the initial disclosure under I-3. It's I-3B. 
I3B is upon receipt of the disclosure statement. Okay, so you get the original disclosure statement and you have X amount of days, 10. Let's say it's 10. Right. So when you're filling out this contract, you say, okay, I want 10 days upon receipt of the seller disclosure to review and reject if, if you want to reject. And then under I4, later discovered inaccurate information, that's another time frame from the discovery. And sometimes you may need more time there, as kind of Tony's alluding to, because you find something that just needs way more investigation than you had thought. So it's not uncommon to say 10 days for SRPDS and then 15 days for later discovered. Not uncommon for that. Sometimes just bigger problems need more time. And the bigger problem is discovered later. But that's 15 days on top of the tech. Not uh, from discovery. Yeah. So whenever it's this. Uh, whenever you tell the seller you yeah. discovered it. <laughs> Well, you weren't here for that part of class. <laughs> <laughs> so what I said is that if it's an issue that you discover that's going to take money to repair, you want to know how much the repair costs are before you tell the seller that, hey, this is what I discovered. Because you can say, I discovered this and this is the cost to do it. They're not going to say, when did you discover it? I just told you, I discovered it and this is the cost to fix it. So you drag it out to the last possible day. It's like playing chess. You have to kind of know the contract so you can play chess better than the person on the other side. Yep, totally, totally. That's a lot of brain power section. I. I'm tired already. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're done for today. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, who wants to, did that answer your question, Audrey? Okay. We're on the way. Yeah. Next slide. Buyer's remedies regarding mandatory seller disclosure statement. If seller fails to comply with paragraph I1 or I2, buyer may elect to complete the purchase of the property. When buyer is provided a disclosure statement, doc documents or amended disclosure statement, and buyer decides to rescind the purchase contract, buyer shall not be entitled to any damages or shall be entitled to the return of all deposits, and in such case, Buyer deposits shall be returned immediately. If seller negligently fails to provide the required disclosure statement, documents, or amended disclosure statement, seller shall be liable to buyer for the amount of actual damages suffered as a result of seller's negligence. The court may also award the prevailing party attorney's fees, court costs, and administrative fees. Buyer's rights to rescind the purchase contract under paragraph I3 and I4 shall not apply after the scheduled closing date. Any action to rescind the purchase contract under paragraph I3 and I4 shall commence prior to the scheduled closing date. So the tricky thing for I5 is that it doesn't it doesn't state when the seller has to or when they can cancel the contract if the buy, if the seller doesn't comply, right? See, if I was going to rewrite the contract, I would say if the seller fails to comply with paragraphs I1 and I2 and the time frames provided, then buyer may cancel, move forward. But you'll probably have someone that just says a week before closing, like, hey, you guys never provided me with the updated disclosure statement, and therefore we're going to cancel. So for you and your question... You know, you can say, hey, you guys never, I've been asking you for it for like three weeks now. You never provide it. And now we're going to cancel using I-5. Yeah, that's a good one. And that can just be an email. There's no form we have to fill There's notification. No form. You just say, hey, in accordance, in accordance with paragraph I-5, we have repeat the buyer has repeatedly asked you for an updated and amended disclosure statement of which you have not provided. Buyer elects to terminate this contract in accordance with I five. Right, but if you don't really want to cancel, then you just send an email saying we have that right due to I five. Yeah, because I've totally had that happen, but then the buyer usually is just like yeah, well, that's that, yeah, that's usually the problem. I mean, like, look, if if you do a home inspection and there's a couple of knobs miss, missing on your stove, that's not like. That's not a material fact. So you can't you can't play this out, right? But if you got like some major problems with the house, 
like that's when this really comes into play. Because if you're a buyer paying good money for a house, you don't want to close and have to spend another, I don't care if it's 5,000, 10,000 or whatever the price is. Like you should be, you should get a house that's worth what you're paying for without all the discrepancies. Um, we don't really have to go through all of the general disclosures. Good. <laughs> but I do I do want to say something with regards to um general disclosure C. Asbestos. Asbestos. Um and this and this there's asbestos pretty much in everything in the house. Um we had a buyer close on a property. <clears throat> that had been renovated. And I don't really know why the buyer did this, but we had represented the buyer in the transaction, but he sued the seller for not disclosing that there was asbestos in the drywall, um, in the drywall mud. And I'm not really sure what happened to it because we weren't involved in it. But I mean, the fact that the guy, I think the guy was just looking for money because I know that he was looking for about $250,000. Um, and I recently sold a property in a condo where the sellers did have all the drywall mud tested in the unit. And they gave a detailed report from um, an environmental company and they had to paint test it because they were selling bulk units. So they knew that if they didn't, if they didn't disclose that they, there would be a potential lawsuit of like, you know, 48 lawsuits. So they went and had everything tested. I was pretty impressed on that. Hmm. So aside from that, you know, you got like old houses um, with the old, you know, eight, eight inch by eight inch tiles that you see like at city mill that, that, are, that are already on the floor that, that has asbestos in it. Sometimes the canic ceilings can have asbestos. So there's asbestos everywhere, mm -hmm. you know. <clears throat> when I mean, asbestos can be uh, a buzzword for a buyer. And what's difficult is if you're representing a buyer on a fixed budget, which most buyers have, you want something in town at a good price, but they're sensitive to asbestos. The bottom line is then they have to look for a newer built unit, which then immediately will then have them reconsider. Not that you're trying to force them one way or the other, but that's the reality of it. Because why would you want asbestos unless you had to take it, right? If you wanted to buy a house or a unit, you didn't have the money to buy a brand new one, then you have to buy something used. And unfortunately, a lot of the, the projects here are older than 78. 79. 79, whatever it is. Not, no, right, not right. only 79, you know, because I think they, it was outlawed, but they were able to re use whatever they had beyond that. Yeah. 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 So... So I'm going to tell you a little story that not too many people know, having to deal with asbestos. And this personally happened to me. So I'm, uh, you know, I will never make this mistake again. So I bought a condo with a, with a friend of mine to flip. And uh, so disclosure statement said had no asbestos. I uh, start scraping the popcorn ceiling. I'm wetting it. I've got maybe six square feet neighbor calls on me. I get cited, I get a letter from the uh, Department of Health. I get an attorney. And so the attorney calls the Department of Health because he knew the guy, to, the attorney on the side. And he goes, uh, what's what's precedence for uh, asbestos removal without a permit? And the guy goes, oh, he says, your guy's the only guy who's ever got caught. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, shit, right? <laughs> so you will be it. <laughs> so I, I said, I'll be it. So it cost me as much money to remove whatever I had left as it would have, but I had just hired a remedial company in the first place. I think it was like maybe $4,000. So was that a long time ago? This was um, probably like 20 years ago. Oh yeah. Cause probably more than that now. Yeah. So, um, so we go to the hearing and I think I got whacked with a $10,000 fine hmm. knocked down to 1500 providing that I don't ever get caught again. <laughs> and the attorney tells the attorney tells my attorney goes, 
wow, I can't believe that they were going to whack him with 10 grand. He says, I did the same thing. <laughs> I never got caught. So, uh, you know, when in doubt, just get it tested. You know, it costs like have somebody come in. It costs maybe a hundred bucks. You know, put your, put your mind at ease. Put your seller's mind at ease. Um, <laughs> wastewater disposal. I have a question. Yes. I have had a client that... They said they removed the popcorn and they did. And then they were going to redo the cabinets two years later and they took off the cabinets and, and there was this under all the cabinets. Yeah. Then is that like a false disclosure or is that just, I mean, they were like, whatever. But if they were upset about it, maybe they were like negative Nancy because they have done something. Yeah. I mean, they could have, you know, if they take down the cabinets, they could force them to. They could force them to write a check to have somebody come in and, you know, remedy, you know, remove it because, you know, maybe your clients are not going to put the cabinets back in the same location as the old cabinets were. Right. Mm -hmm. And so therefore there's a cost to them. How long after closing did that take place? The cabinets came down? Um, I mean, I got the pictures here and I think it was maybe a year. A year. Yeah. A year and a half. Is there a limit, like a two year limit or something like that or no? It's two years from discovery. I think it was like 2020 mm. and I think like if you like, popcorn, like is this asbestos? No, like, probably. Yeah. I mean the law is like two years from discovery. Like if yeah. your clients know about it and they wait like three years to say something about it, like the statute is passed. But it's two years. From but it's two years from discovery. That you have to say something. Yeah. So even though they discovered it six months ago. And yeah, you have two, you have two years, you have two years from whenever they discover it. But not all popcorn stands, especially. No. Uh, built before 78. Yeah. So they just like text me a picture of popcorn and I was like, yeah, probably. And then she was like, no, don't worry about it. I just wanted to know. Like, I don't this But she was super shocked by yeah, it's hmm. a good one. Uh, wastewater, you know, they're changing. Um, they're changing the sewer, the septic, you know, all that stuff. I think it's pushed out to like 2035 now. So that needs to be updated. What about um, the building permits? So if you're representing a buyer and you're buying a single family home, um, you can either, when you write the offer, require a seller to provide a professional building permits package. So it's not just the permits, but also the drawings. Um, or if they don't want to do that, explain to buyer, this is something that you should consider buying or you buy it for them, one of the two. And if you find that there's something that's irregular with the building permits package and what they're selling on MLS, guess what? New disclosure. Um, but it happens all the time where you know, they, they build things and they don't apply for permits. And this lanai that is enclosed now, it's it's not permitted. No one has ever complained. All the neighbors did the same thing. Doesn't matter. Doesn't mean that it's legal. So you want to make sure your buyer understands what they're buying. And if you can get something for it, great. Uh, but if you can't and still want to buy it, it's up to them. Yeah. And if you got, if your buyer is buying a house that doesn't have, um, that has permits that haven't closed yet, but there have been renovations where they have, but there have been major renovations with no building permits. If city and county comes back, they're going to find the buyer on a daily basis until they get a permit for the improvements. Yep. So buyer beware of, you know, properties that were done by people that are flipping houses that do it with no permits. Um, it becomes an issue for the buyer. And typically what will happen is the city doesn't just randomly go out there and look at properties or um, issues. It's neighbors that call, like your asbestos removal. Yeah, it's right. Because once the city is notified of, a, of, of something, then they have to investigate. If they're never notified, it's like no harm, no foul, right? Um, Do they have to review the permits for them? I'm sorry? So with the permits, do we have to review the permits for the buyers? No, I would just uh, have a contract to do it. Re re review, did you say? So how do you suggest the company for that? Or? You mean to get the building permit package? Yeah. 
Oh no, there's a company. Yeah, there's a company it. that does it. Yeah. So they will yeah. go down and pull it and then email it to you. I think it's like called Hawaii Property Real Estate Search. Building yeah, it's like uh like Google Ann Carnuth, K A R N U T H. She runs that company. Um, she should pop up, but I think it's Hawaii Building Permit. Yeah, something like that. We just go online, just give them the TMK number, the address, and tell them exactly what you want, and they'll tell you how it's going to, how much it's going to cost. If you're looking for architectural plans, architectural plans, they're going to charge you a fee for each page. So it just depends on how detailed your buyers want to be. Has Has anyone ever gone down to the Department of um, Planning and Permitting at the city? So there's a whole section there, right? That you can go in, give them a TMK number, and they'll pull all the permits for that property. And they'll give it to you. You can look at it. It'll either be on Microfish. Um, I think they're trying to digitize all of that, but um, it's there. But the idea is to hire a third party to do that. Because if you do it and you miss a page, it's on you, right? So have them pay for that. Um, what else are we going to say? All the, all, the, all the drawings from, I think it's, I want to say 78. But all residential drawings uh, were destroyed because it was a flood in the basement of the city building. So you will have the actual permits, the description of the permits, but no drawings to support that. Yeah, so just be aware of that. So sometimes you got to match up a description with a drawing that the tax department did on the property. And that's that's so when it's older properties, it gets kind of sketchy trying to figure out what would be considered legal and what's not legal. But as long as you can find some evidence of it being there from before, I think it would be deemed kind of legal. Yeah, and sometimes you you see you know comments on billing permits. Um, so you may you know it's like, hey, Mister Mister Seller, can you? I mean, if it's within the time they own the property, right? If there's something from 1945 and they bought it and. 70 they're not going to know but at least you have a history of it right but yeah. if they did some building permits and maybe they didn't get closed out or maybe they're still open maybe they were rejected and you can ask them you know why was this not taken care of you know what kind of electrical work did you do i just closed on a property in um enchanted lakes we we had the disclosure statement and we had the the uh, survey um and the building permit package so i walked the survey Notice that there was a section that showed um, like the description was rubble or pallets or something, something very, not very, um, um, something that could easily be taken down or fall down. And then I, I noticed that there were no permits for part of the wall. So, so that part, they had built the wall and then the other part, they built up the wall. I didn't find a permit for that either. So there's a lot of things that you can, you have access to a lot of information that you can cross reference to find out what is going on with that property. And so remember I was telling you about agents wanted to push back about disclosure. So that agent didn't want to have the seller disclose that they didn't have a permit for this small section of the wall or the addition of this uh, wall height that they built on top of the old wall. But unless you're going through all these different documents, it's kind of hard sometimes to realize what is there, what is there legal and legally, and what is there not legally, or not permitted, I should say. What about when they say you know the bedrooms don't match the tax records? Does that just mean they didn't get permits? It's a hint. So usually they're trying to hint at something when they say yeah. that. Yeah. Well, you know there are there are some you know newer homes <clears throat> in developments where. I mean, they built a four bedroom, but tax department has, or the city and county has like a three bedroom, but, you know, it's like a brand new house. Mm -hmm. So in that, in that case, like, I'm not really worried about it, but if it's an old house that was originally like a three bedroom, it's not like a five bedroom with no permit and, you know, yeah, it, 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 yeah, I was, I was going to say that I think, you know, as long as the square interior square footage matches what's there to MLS and to the records, but the beds and baths or the primarily the beds are off. I think you can go to the tax department 
and have them update that record. So if you're selling something, I don't think it takes very long if you wanted to do that. I may be wrong, but I don't think it's very long to update that tax yeah. record. But Just so that everything matches up. Right. But if the square footage doesn't match, yeah, that's match up, right? That's different. Like you're buying a 2,000 square foot house and you only have 1,200 for the tax records. That becomes an issue because not only does it all have to be permitted with drawings, but now the property taxes go up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that way they... They added 800 square feet. Right. Because they don't want to pay the tax. Right. And so, and that's, and so when you have a listing and you have that scenario where it's, you know, it's 2,000 square feet, tax record say 1,200, don't ever put an, an MLS that tax record is different from the square footage. Put it in the remarks section because the tax department used to have access to MLS. And they started calling the agents and saying, hey, how many square feet do you really have? And then they go and ding the owners. And now the owner's like upset at the agent for disclosing that. So be careful what you disclose. So if you're selling 2000 but legally only 1200 what do you put as square footage in MLS? You know the section that says? I put the original square footage. 1200 Because I don't want to get, I don't want to get. Under promise, over yeah. I don't want to. I don't want somebody to say, "Well, Tony, you told me it was two thousand square feet." Well, legally, only twelve, and it's only legally twelve hundred, yeah. right? Because then I have some liability. So when people are in the condo and have two and on one side, they extend, so they lose that one eye and gain one side square footage. That's supposed to be permitted. Well, I bet you. I mean, so it should be. Yes. Yeah, it it should be permitted, and if it's not, I'm I'm surprised that the association will let them do that. And the reason being is because your buildings only allow so much living square footage, and so if everybody starts adding, you know, extra square footage by enclosing their own eyes, it changes everything. You know, it changes everything with the building department, and the building is now a violation. So, um, so. So here, here's because the reason not why. because it because the building is the building is only allowed fifty thousand square feet of living space, mm -hmm. and now everybody enclosed their land ice. Now it's sixty thousand. Mm -hmm. So now the building's in violation as an association. That's right? why never in a condo never assume because they have some tolerance there, uh -huh. or they might say, okay, we have enough leeway to allow fifty percent of the units to enclose their land ice but no more than that. Right. So it could be where 50% has proper approvals. And when it's a condo, it's not just city and county. It's the association as well. And you'll get, when it, when it comes to associations, you get all types. You got some that are very strict and others that are so loose that they could care less. They have no records. But so correctly, if they do it correctly, yeah. they you have approval both. from the association. And, and the city and county. Permit. Right. Yes. And then, that they've added square footage. And it's legal. Square and it's footage. legal, yeah. yeah. And if they are missing, typically they might have, I mean, if they have city and county, they have to have building. I, I don't know how they would have city and not building for approval. But anyway, um, but a lot of times you'll have the building say, oh yeah, we don't really police that. It's okay. It's enclosed. We're not going to do anything about it. I mean, you know, buyers got to know that that's the position that they, they take today. But if the association members change, they could in, start enforcing that. So at your own risk, right? Yeah. At your own some risk. Some of them do it like real. Some of them just scream. And, and yeah. Mean, that's yeah. not, yeah, that's not like, like really a full enclosure. You know, right. full enclosure is like I got a line and I push my doors all the way yeah. out, you know, 15 feet. Um, you know, and then, they may have, like as Ken said, you know, they may have some leeway for fifty percent. So if your buyer is looking at a condo and says, "I'll oh, just, can I push out the lanai?" You say yes, and then he goes to apply for it, and the association says, "Sorry, we've already maxed out. <clears throat> we've already maxed out the square footage. You can't do it." I didn't know. What yeah. yeah, because that it's all calculations on um, uh, common like ingress, egress, parking, mm -hmm. uh, fire escapes. All of this, I think, all tie into that total square footage living okay. living space. Do they sorry, do they change like changes your square footage, then do you have to pay more HOA because you have more square footage? 
Mm, I've not seen mm, that. I don't, I don't think. I don't, I don't know. So. I don't think so. That's a good question, though. Yeah, yeah. but I don't. But your percentage of carbon, your your percentage doesn't change. It's based on the footprint, right? So if they're going to charge you more, that means that they have to go and redo all the CPR documents and change everybody's common percentage of interest. Yeah. Right? I'm just trying to pay less which way. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, it's not a condo, it's a home. And say you're representing the seller and it does it not. How hard is it to get that fixed? You need a contractor and you need an architect. It's hard. <laughs> it's going right? to take time. You heard how long it takes for the building department to approve it's permits, approved. right? It's going to be appraised on tax, yeah, on tax records. Legal square footage. Legal square footage. Legal square footage. Because tax records may not match. Legal. Yeah. Tax department, building department, two different departments yeah. in the city. They're not always the same. That's the issue. So if the house has the bunch of things done without permit, how do you know assume that they're Actually, it's on the buyer's side. Is it is uh, have they added square footage or are they just updated updated the kitchen? Yeah, well, if it's actually yeah, that's that's a that becomes a problem because if you're buying it, you know, with two kitchens and only one of them is legal, and I don't know, a city inspector comes out for some reason and they tell you to remove the kitchen, like now you don't have an extra kitchen. And if your buyer pay for an extra kitchen. Now he doesn't have one, he's going to come to you, right? No, if they, for example, if they knew that it, it just disclosed that it's not illegal. Well, then you have to tell them, say, hey, it's illegal. If you get caught, somebody reports you, they're going to they're gonna force you to take it out. And how can we put it in disclosures? You're representing the seller? Buyer. If it's in the disclosure statement, just let them know what, what may happen to them, mm -hmm. right? So are are you in this situation now? No, no, no. Oh, okay. So if you were to get into that situation, first thing I look at is legally, how many kitchens can I have? One. Okay. So if it's one and there, and actually there's two there, normally the sellers and the seller's agent, they're smart enough to not represent the sale as a two kitchen sale when they know they can only have one. So they'll remove things. They'll remove the stove. They'll remove the refrigerator and and put flowers in its place. Yeah, knowing that you know what it can actually end up being later when you close, and then it's, it's on you at that point. Yeah, right. Because for a kitchen, you have to have a refrigerator, a stove, and a sink. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times you see refrigerator and a sink, and then a hot plate. So then it's not really a kitchen because it's lacking the three elements. Yeah. And I think from an appraisal standpoint, right? I don't think the appraisal will go through if it's. Yeah. In the legal kitchen so the lender will, will stop it mm -hmm. that's why as a seller i don't think you can sell in this all cash because i think there are too many red flags for many people to be able to sell it like that when it's in the legal kitchen yes, we were looking yesterday at a house that had a few duplets that they made in four units but legally it's duplets yeah buyer beware on that one yeah, I mean, you know, back in the day, look, there's a lot of properties like that in Hawaii because we're just, you know, short of housing. But, you know, as long as you know what you're getting into, yep. you know. Mm -hmm. But if your neighbor reports you for like having four different families living in a single family house or a duplex, you know, somebody's going to come by and shut you down. And I, you know, I, I, I have a house in Wahiawa and I pull out the billing permit package and, um, cause the seller said, Hey, is this, you know, I've got two floors. I've been, I've been renting it out like to two different people. Is that legal? I'm like, well, not according to this fine that you guys got in like 1965, right. Where they were cited for having two kitchens, you know? So I said, no, it's just, it's a single family residence. <laughs> so as long as the, as long as the buyer is okay with it as long as the buyer is fully aware of what's you know what the ramifications are if they get caught or if they make a change right mm -hmm. then it's okay but if it's not disclosed and you know no one told them that that it's not a legal duplex and the second and the other kitchen is not legal and now they got to take the kitchen out that becomes a problem. It has to be in 
sense. Yeah. Yeah, the key is the buyer can buy whatever they want. Um, you need to protect yourself to make sure that the buyer never feels that you're giving them information that justifies their purchase because you know better than them. So R6, you guys got to read R6 because R6 tells you who you are or actually who you're not, right? Because that's where it gets very tricky. If, if for some reason they feel that, oh, you told them to do that and it was okay. And they, like you said, right, short-term memory, mm -hmm. then they're going to come back to you. When they order in the building permit package, do we still explain it to them? Well, I mean, do you know what's in it? Mm -hmm. Then you can't explain it. So it's not always. Just say, hey, here's a building permit package. I don't know how to read it. You know, if you have a contractor friend, have him go over with you. I mean, the red flags would be like if you have a bunch of building permits and none of them are closed out. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's there's so many things, unfortunately, to kind of learn. <laughs> and, um, you know, you can sit in class all day and learn all these things, but it hits whoever hits the road when you're actually in a transaction that's when it really sticks um and you know we, we're only talking about the main contract we're not even talking about the addendums right we should if there's time at the end of this or maybe yeah. you have a continuation later yeah while we're having lunch on the last day do the addendums we'll do the addendums oh, right that's what you know yeah. uh no last day you were you, you came a little bit late right so last day if everybody still shows up i'll treat you to lunch yeah no, don't don't expect lobsters or you know you know steak. But anyway, let's let's move on. So um, as Kent was saying, mold disclosure is a big thing. So whether wherever there's like a water leak, you know there could be mold lurking. So you probably want to have um, you know home inspectors. They have these uh, gadgets that they can look at a spot and they can tell you if there's moisture behind the wall. Get that stuff investigated. If there's moisture underneath you know, laminate flooring, then more than likely there's been a leak underneath and there's still water trapped. Um, flood zones, flood zones, that's really important because that affects property insurance. Mm -hmm. um, and, if, and and building, what you're allowed to build. Right, right. Don't you guys have a listing where you can't build anything else because... My house is in a flood spring zone. That's why I know that so well. Yours is? Wow. I believe that or not. Um... And so, and flood zones are changing, right? Yeah. There's going to be no more, you know, there was like, um, I think it was required this past uh, CE classes was like hot topics. And the biggest thing is really like global warming and flood zones. You know, there's no such thing as like a hundred year flood zone any longer. Like it can happen. Yeah. It, that's just, there's, there's no more such thing as a hundred year flood zone. Yeah. All that stuff is gone. Right. With like Google. Or there's, some place to find out where there's a link, right? There's a link. Yeah. Link. There's a link to it. Yeah. It says, is your property in a tsunami flood or a flood zone? In a flood zone. Yeah. What's the name of the disclosure? Uh, well, it's in the sales disclosure statement. It's a question. Yeah. It's a, it's yeah, a question, it's, right? But yeah. there is a place that you can go to. And take a look at what your, what the zone is, what flood zone that property is in. And we don't have an environmental report that shows all the info, like in depth on the property and whether it's in a flood zone and all of that info on that. Yeah, there's a there's a there's a website that connects to FEMA. And you can pull up a street mm -hmm. and it'll tell you like on Queen Street. Like on Queen Street, I had a property on Queen Street for sale. It was commercial property, but that way. The site, the Queen Street, the, the ocean side of Queen Street was in a flood zone. The mountain side of Queen Street was not. And it was very clear, you know. Is that part of the real estate um, paperwork in the line? Or no? Because it wasn't California sales it's not a it's not It's not a requirement, yeah. but I like to know so I can <laughs> disclose everything. Yeah. yeah. We had to pull that report. And yeah. Blood, yeah. Uh, earthquake, all See, that, that would make sense if we had that. It makes yeah. it makes it easier for you, right? Yeah. Because now, yeah, because now you got to go. If you're the seller's agent, 
in the disclosure statement, it asks things like, are you in a uh, a, a flight zone? Right. You know, if you're near the military base, stuff like that. And yeah. ordinance, or, well, I don't know. Yeah. They may not know. Yeah. yeah right. But you, but, stuff, you, but you, but you, but you, but they have a website too. For like, if you're in the military zone, like you can type an address and they'll tell you yes or no. So I always like to like, especially if you if you're close to a base. Right, you want to pull out that information. But yours is a one-stop shop, right? It just gets pulled for every property. Yeah, and it's got. Yeah, all yeah. See, we don't have that. Yeah, we don't have that. We're behind the times. We don't have that. You know, and we used to, and we used to have links, you know, in the purchase contract. But some of the links, you know, the state doesn't doesn't keep the website up. So we we you know, forms committee took everything out. But there are resources out there to go and search the flood zones and things like that. Uh, lead-based paint, anything. Uh, prior to 1978, uh, use a paint, you know, lead-based paint disclosure statement. Um, what I also like to do is I like to print out the, um, mm -hmm. what's it called? Uh, effects of lead on your yeah. like a pamphlet. Yeah, the pamphlet, lead-based paint. Pamphlet. Yeah, just, you know, throw that up into uh, in MLS's uh, additional disclosures or additional, inf you know, information. Climate change, wired funds is a big thing. Um, that's why a lot of emails will come out with, uh, you know, don't open up any attachments. Beware of people asking for money. Um, we talked about that the last time, right? If you're going to advise your client, if your client wants to wire, not you advise them. If they want to wire, make sure that they're talking to the escrow officer before any money goes over, confirming everything. Okay. The big one, J1. J1. Who's next? Eyes disclosures, right? If buyer fails to make an election in writing to terminate the purchase contract within the specified time period, then buyer will have waived this contingency. That's why, if there's issues that the buyer needs a little bit further investigation on, that's why it's important to get all your your costs so your buyer can make an informed decision at the end of whatever that time frame is, or if you, actually a few days before that. Because now, if you know, if the, if you need a credit and you have to go back to the seller, and you do it within twenty four hours, it's not enough time to negotiate. So you put the buyer at a disadvantage. So do the inspection as early as possible. Also, get an inspector that actually tests all the appliances. I mean, I had an inspection company that I will not name, nor will I ever use them again, who said that two of the burners on the stove, stove was brand new now, that they weren't working. But he says that I'm not allowed to see if the heating elements are actually plugged in. So I like just lift it up and stuck them back in, turn it on. It's like, hey, it works. <laughs> but he had done that on a number of on a number of things, like didn't pull out the fridge to see if the ice maker thing was was connected. So get a guy that's, you know, get a company that's really, really thorough and, you know, ask him that. 
ask him that up front before you make an appointment with an inspection company. What do you do and what, what don't you do? Yeah. Yeah, I was surprised when they would say like a light wasn't working, but they didn't just try another light bulb. Right. Mm -hmm. So that they're they're supposedly not allowed. I guess. Yeah, for, for those kinds of things, it typically yeah. won't. Yeah, but yeah, I have seen guys. So Tony is absolutely right. I mean, you you want an inspector who is very thorough, um, but at the same time, you want an inspector that knows how to deliver the message. Because you're never going to find the perfect home. It doesn't exist, and if they deliver it in a way that scares the buyer, then, you know, it, it, anything can be fixed. It's what are we talking about? We're talking about money. And so it should never be delivered to where the buyer is scared. I mean, they should be concerned, but not scared, right? They just need to know, is it within my budget to get it resolved or will the seller resolve it so that I can move forward? So the I've seen all kinds of inspectors because I dealt with listings, right? I've seen guys who don't go on the roof when actually they should. They need to inspect the roof. I've seen guys that won't crawl under a house. They should do that. I've seen guys that don't look for shutoff um, valves. Kind of need to know how to turn off your water in case there's ever a leak. Um, they'll pull up the, the stove and look for, uh, they have a, a, a meter. They'll look for signs of uh, gas leaking. Um, you know, all the appliances, all the doors, everything. Some guys are very thorough. Others aren't. The other thing to look for is a good report. So if you want to interview an inspector that you maybe have not worked before with before, ask them, can you send me a report so that I can see how you deliver the information? Because it's important that you can use that information because you may want to ask the seller for a credit or for a repair or for money. And so where are you going to get it from? You're going to get it from the report. You're going to have to cut and paste it from the report and then use that as your justification for whatever you can ask for. And as Tony said, as soon as you get into escrow, even maybe prior to, especially if you have a good relationship with an inspector, let them know, I'm submitting offers. How's your schedule? Because if you have a you know, 10 day J1 and they can't get out there to day eight, I would look for another inspector. You don't have enough time, right? You don't have enough time, one, if it goes perfectly then and you accept it, then yeah, you have enough time. But that rarely ever happens. The time that you'll need is to, one, share it with the, with the buyer and understand, okay, buyer, how do you feel about this? Are there any concerns? Two, you want to maybe get an expert out there. Maybe you need a roofer out there. Maybe you need a plumber out there. Who knows? Electrician. So you need time for that. And the third thing is you need time to be able to ask the seller for something. And have them respond within this time frame, because you got to provide them with enough time to digest that information and make a decision as well. So I'm I'm trying to give the the seller at least three four days if possible to respond, never like 24 hours because it's that's going to be tough unless you know that the seller is desperate to sell. But even then, it's kind of it's too it's too close. And understand that if you don't cancel by the end of J1, you accept. And so if you if you submit a request and only give them 24 hours and they don't respond, you as the agent, you're stuck. You need to know from the from the buyer, hey, if I don't get a response, what do you want me to do? So I put the buyer in that in in that position before it ever happens, so that I know that that, that midnight tonight, if I don't hear back what you want, Mr. Buyer. And they may, maybe have them pre-sign a cancellation. I am going to shoot this off to the seller. Actually, eleven fifty-nine. Yeah, eleven fifty-nine. Yes. What's the customary time frame you guys do for the J one inspections? I think condos you can kind of do ten days as long as you get your inspection up front. Single family homes, I like to see fifteen. Um, you know, bigger homes that have pools. You know, central AC. I go thirty days. What kind of inspectors besides the home inspector do you recommend? Or have you roof you... inspector, AC inspector, pool inspector, um gas. like gas PV, like if you got photovoltaic. Mm -hmm. Um I've sold houses with generators. I'd have a guy come in and you know run the generator and make sure that thing's all 
up to snuff. Um, so the house went an elevator and I had to have an <laughs> elevator inspected one time. Good luck finding uh, it. Again. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I I like to recommend I I always recommend that they hire the additional inspectors, um, but it's up to them as to whether or not they don't want to. Yeah, and what you try to do is, which sometimes is not possible, but you try to coordinate all those people to come at the same time as your home inspection, so you don't have to go back and forth, back and forth. Right, so you get a your home inspector, your roofer guy, your you know your your uh, gas inspector within. You know, within that same time frame would be ideal for for you as the agent. So it just saves a lot of time. So the home inspector doesn't inspect you. Home inspector is a generalist. Yeah. So they'll report what they see. They they won't open up walls or anything of that sort. They're just going to take pictures and report what they see. They'll, so they'll say, you know, notice that there's a lot of granules missing from this uh, from the sh from the shingles. Um, appears to have five years of usable life left. But bring in bring in bring in a roofer to verify. You guys have anybody you recommend for the home We do, but it costs money for that. <laughs> <laughs> I can give you a couple of names. Yeah, we can get a list. Yeah. Um. So uh, so I I you know we're talking about like this is the contract that I got on one of my list things and the J one inspection period is, is one day. Uh, but being the guy I am, I counted back with seven days and they left uh, no property condition and maintenance for final walkthrough, but. They said no to final walkthrough. Yeah. Wow. Oh. <clears throat> no, 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 no. The buyers wrote one day for J one oh, and were... no J three. Oh. I changed it all so they can go and, do yeah, a final walkthrough inspection, especially if you know that the seller's going to accept it or yeah. at least have a feeling that that's pretty customary, right? Yeah, um, no, I think they knew they were going to gut the property anyway, but you know, just never know. Yeah, like to give, I'd like to give them, you know, adequate time. Yeah. Okay, you will go. Why don't you go J2 and J3 for us? I want you to, I want you to underline that, okay? In the same condition as when buyer inspected the property pursuant to J1. Oh, and also underline interior and exterior. A lot of people think it's only the interior. So the grass better be the same height as when they did the inspection. <laughs> Okay, I want you to um on J three, I want you to put five days minimum. And I'll explain it why after we uh go through J four. 
Joy. Withheld collected funds for repairs and maintenance. If seller has failed to maintain the property pursuant to paragraph J3, or has not completed any agreed upon repairs and or corrections no later than the time period specified in paragraph J3, parties agree that 150% of the estimated cost shall be withheld or collected from seller and retained in escrow until completion. The parties shall immediately sign escrow's formal withholding and disbursement instructions slash agreements, confirming the withholding set forth in this paragraph. All bills for maintenance and repairs or corrections will be paid through escrow. Any balance remaining after completion of all maintenance and repairs slash corrections shall be returned to seller, provided, however, that if maintenance and repairs or corrections are not completed by closing date or within certain days after closing, said funds will be dispersed to buyer. Okay, so on that one, um, J4. Um, check um, the box before closing date. <clears throat> Never, ever, ever delete J3. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people say, oh, well, the house was clean. The house was this. It's not lived in. Um, it's been vacant for a while. And therefore, everything is good. If you don't have a J3 inspection, if it's if it's NA and you happen to go to the house anyway and find out that somebody went in there and what do you call that when they write it on the walls? Uh graffiti. graffitied all the walls, like you don't have any like you don't have any recourse. You have no recourse whatsoever. If there were repairs that were supposed to be done, and even if J3 is is applicable. If repairs are supposed to have been done as part of your J1 negotiations and you go in there and the repairs are not completed, if you have a short time frame, um, if you have like three days, you cannot pull recording. Does everybody know how recording works? If you're going to record on Friday, documents are sent to the Bureau of Conveyances on Wednesday. The loan is normally funded on Tuesday. So if you do your inspection on Tuesday or Wednesday, you can't pull recording because it's already down to Bureau of Conveyances. Your loan's already been funded. And even if you are able to pull recording, once the loan is funded, you're gonna be incurring interest, even if you don't close. Five days gives you enough time to go in there, find out if the repairs were done, or, if the property is not in the same condition as it was when you went on the contract, you need to get quotes from contractors, submit those invoices so that escrow can automatically hold withhold 150% of whatever the repairs are going to be. So never always have a J3 and always have at least five days. So actually that's a great explanation of um, the recordation piece and the time frame involved. So should it be five business days? If it, if that's the purpose. Because mm. it could be close uh, record Wednesday and then Saturday, Sunday comes into play. Right, you do the walkthrough Saturday. But that means if it, it records, on, if it records. Um, Funds Friday. Friends on, yeah. It would be sent in on yeah. Monday. I mean, take a look at your timeline if you know when closing is going to be. Like, if you have, if you have within forty-five days, or on or before, or if you have a specific date in your purchase contract, um, go ahead and calculate how many days you may need, and try not to use a very specific date in your purchase contract because what happens if you write an offer and say we're going to close on January sixteenth, and you wrote this on December sixteenth. And you've gone back and forth, offer counter offer now it's December 25th. And it still says the 16th of January for closing, like you've lost a whole bunch of time. Yeah. So just always say within X amount of days from acceptance, from acceptance yeah. or the day after acceptance. So yeah. the first day is never considered the day of you know the first day that the contract starts. It's always the day after. So, so an example that you said that the loan would go on 
On Tuesday, what would happen Wednesday? Uh, it goes down to the bureau. Okay. And then once it's at the bureau, you can't pull it. Yeah, it's gonna close. It's gonna record. So going back to J three, which is the final walkthrough. Um, so that's your last chance to make sure that it's in the same condition before you close. So what I would do is I would kind of do my own version of a home inspection, right? Turn everything on, flush all the toilets, run the washing machine, open all the cabinets, just to see, is everything kind of, and then have my disclosure statement and home inspection with me. Because sometimes you might find something forgetting that it was already disclosed or discovered. Um, and then if it all passes, then you're good. If it doesn't pass and you, and you find the problem, then J4 applies. So know that even though it says 150%, and correct me if I'm wrong, of the estimated cost to remedy that, whatever that is, it still requires a seller to agree, right? No. I, I can tell escrow. No, this. it just says, uh, it says. Um, <clears throat> the parties agree that 150% of the estimated cost shall be withheld, collected from seller hmm. and retained in escrow. I always feel like escrow is saying, okay, that's fine, but I need to get seller signatures. But okay, so if that's the case, then no problem. Yeah. Because I have seen it where the washing machine didn't work and they need to call a repairman in to fix it. Right? <clears throat> so now, if something unusual or really bad happens uh, for J3, then sell, seller has to do a update to the disclosure statement. Yeah. You can you extend know? too, right? Yeah, yeah well, I mean, you have to extend. Yeah. But if a big tree just fell on the house and now there's no kitchen roof, um, there's no roof over the kitchen, like you're probably going to want to cancel. But it doesn't say anything about <laughs> canceling or extending. So then all parties need to agree to cancel or extend. For for J4 or, yeah, or J3? Funds, but it doesn't say that it like depends it doesn't say you can cancel the contract in j3 or j3. no but it's a new it's a disclosure no but j3 is a disclosure yeah j3 if there's something that happens to the like somebody goes in and graffiti it that's a disclosure yeah and then f3 a if you have, that hasn't been used you know the unilateral extension that you can use that to extend yeah. as well but you know, at that point, it, there's well, an issue. If you want to extend, then you like, and and it has been used. Then you need them to. Then they both both parties have to agree. And then, so the buyer, right? What does the, what's the buyer's power at that point? No disclosure. I can cancel if you don't want to. Yeah, that's pretty much it, right? Because unless the seller agrees, like if you've already burnt out, you know, like F F three F three A the closing date. Um, if the seller, you know, he may update the disclosure statement, but he doesn't need to agree to an extended. I mean, he may be the disclosure statement doesn't need to agree extended. to an extended closing day. Yeah. But I mean, if you're that close, the disclosure statement date goes past the closing day, then it doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah. Anytime, anytime that you go, anytime a date is coming up for a certain um, contingency, it's not an automatic extension to the closing day. Yeah. If you if you need more time for a loan, you got to extend both. Um, is this like for the final walkthrough? Yes. <clears throat> I would say you'd have to extend closing and get the utilities turned on. I mean, a good seller's agent. Don't let that happen. Won't let that happen, <laughs> right? Or they'll put the, the utilities in their name yeah, and get reimbursed. Or you may have sellers that are out of town. I'll just say, hey, I'm going to I'm gonna turn the utilities on in my name. Um, You guys reimburse me. Um, <clears throat> I mean, it sounds minor, but what happens if you turn everything back on and now the refrigerator doesn't work? That could be thousands of dollars, right? So I... Any questions on J3, J4? Uh, Joanne, can you do uh, J5 and J6, yes. please? 
No continuing warrant. Buyers buyer understands that there is no continuing warrant to be expressed or implied after closing regarding the interior or exterior of the property. Good question. What if something happens after you've done J3? You get, get the keys a couple days later and you go in and there's an issue. Like what kind of issue? Like the house fell on the tree the day before closing. Yeah. Oh, new disclosure. But it's already closed. No, but maybe like, yeah. Maybe. What if somebody broke in and did graffiti or like stole? Like it's such a weird timeline because like, you want to do it five days early, but that still leaves five days for something to happen. Yeah. I mean, that ever happened? I mean, it has. I'm sure it has. It has, I'm sure. Not, not for me, but. Depends on what it is. Yeah. And what can be proven, right? I mean, can you prove that the that the tree fell down before the day of closing, as opposed to after the day of closing? No, I know, I know. Amazing, but a tree didn't fall down after my walk. And it ain't perfect tree, anyways. But like, I did another drive by just because it was like a crazy storm, mm. and I was like, I want to make sure. And then I was like, oh, wow, it actually did fall down. I sent them a picture. And they were like, as long as it's not in the house. Like, it was just yeah, a so tree. Wait, the, the tree moment. fell, but not on the house. Not on the house. But like, it fell after my walkthrough. And it was like that week when it was just crazy, crazy rainy. Did it damage anything yeah. other than the tree? I don't have an answer, but I can tell you that <clears throat> the buyer and seller should be calling their insurance agents. You know, depending on and let them fight it out. But there's definitely some liability, whether it rests on, you know, the seller. I don't know. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's a natural act. You know, it's Mother Nature. Right. Oh, yeah. And, may, you know, you know, I don't think I don't think any lenders are going to close a loan without insurance. Yeah, but make sure you get the Unless insurance. Yeah, get get the insurance taken care of. Uh, tell your buyer to get in touch with their insurance carrier at the beginning of escrow and start getting that going. A lot of times, buyers don't even know. I know, especially new buyers, right? They have they have no reason to have a insurance guy for home. So, okay. Home warranty programs. Buyer understands that buyer may obtain from a third party for a fee home warranties covering appliances, electrical and or gas and plumbing fixtures and equipment and other items included. Okay. Isabel, you want to take uh, J8? Sure. I'm sorry, J7. J J seven. <clears throat> Existing warranties, plans, etc. Seller shall provide to buyer at the closing if such items are in seller's possession. A. Any warrant, warranty documents covering the improvements and all other property being sold. B. Instruction booklets covering the appliances being sold. And C. Improvements, specifications, architecture, and engineering drawings relating to the property which may not reflect improvement as built. Buyer understands that A, any warranties delivered to seller, uh, by seller to buyer will present obligations of other persons or entities, not seller. B, the warranties or documents are provided for informational purpose only. C, seller does not promise that any such warranties are transferable to buyer and D, buyer must contact the providers of such warranties to determine whether the warranties are transferable to buyer. Anybody have any questions on that? Ms. Bella, can you do uh, <clears throat> J8 as well? <clears throat> J8, removal of items from property. No later than X days prior to closing, seller at seller's expense shall remove all trash and junk both inside and outside of the property. 
so that I shall remove all remaining personal belongings from property. Whoever seller may inhabit inhabit the property and however the however the seller may inhabit the property until closing date. No items may be left in trash bins or for bulky item pickup. Should seller not comply with the specific specified time period, the provisions in paragraph J4 shall apply. After the specified time period in J4, buyer shall have the right to keep and dispose of all items. So on J8, you always want to insert a day that is before J3. So if J3 is at five, then J8 and J9 should be at six. Because you don't want to show up on day five for your property condition final walkthrough and find out the seller hasn't moved anything out or clean. The, for, for listings, <clears throat> it's always good to explain these things to, to the sellers. One, what's expected at final walkthrough. Same condition as J1, both inside and outside. So I remind them about that up front so that they know either you're going to mow the yard or you're going to hire, hire somebody to mow the yard because sometimes they've already moved out of the house by then. Same, and same for the stuff, right? When do you have to get the stuff out of the house? Sometimes buyers get con uh, sellers get confused and think that they have to vacate before final walkthrough. But you know they own the house, they own it out of the closing, so they can stay there. But they just have to get out before it records, right? Um, and that's why that's why at the last was the last class where I said uh, the closing within forty five days or whatever the, what I said, and I said. Properties always to be properties to be conveyed vacant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll do I'll do J9 and 10 then. Cleaning no later than X days prior to close. Closing seller shall at seller's expense have the interior of the improvements on the property clean. Cleaning shall include all appliances, cupboards, drawers, floors, jealousies, screens, and windows. Seller shall also have the interior carpets professionally shampooed. Should seller not comply with specified time period. The provision paragraph J4 shall apply. Seller shall have the entire property professionally cleaned with receipts. So it's either or, right? So one, if I'm representing seller and it and it is professionally clean, I make sure that buyer's agent has the receipts. Because a lot of times it might be just as clean if the seller did it himself, but when there's no evidence of it being professionally clean. Bars get to be tend to be more nitpicky. Um, point out that it has to be carpets professionally shampooed, because sometimes if they want to do it themselves, they're going to say, "I'm just going to go rent one of those shampooing machines and do it myself." No, it has to be professionally shampooed. Right, so it's all about setting the expectation. Um, and, and then, but I was going to say, don't check off. The seller shall have the entire property professionally clean with receipts provided. Or is that? Hmm? Yeah, entire property. Because a lot of times people will start nitpicking about the exterior. Hmm. Right? Well, the windows, you should always get the exterior of the windows clean. But, you know, they're going to say, like, how come you didn't pressure wash the driveway or pressure wash the, uh, you know, um, it's too it's too the, vague. It's, right? it's, it's too, too vague. Yeah. When it comes to the exterior. Yep. Yep. Okay, so Jay. Do not check that off and how many days you put it clean. Uh so cleaning is the is, is in the first yeah, the first interior is definitely will definitely happen, but if the when you say entire property professionally clean with receipts, that means like some professional guy had to come and power wash your driveway or power wash the house or remove any lease from the gutters. Like, like I've, it's gotten ridiculous what buyers re, re, request have been. So we just say, and it's like a lot of companies have the policy. It's just, it's always NA. But as far as your question about cleaning, it's always at least one day before your final walkthrough inspection is due. So 
So, yeah, the first part of cleaning does say interior. And it does. It asks for professional receipt uh, receipts. But this, uh, I'm just confused about the screens at the windows. What if they say that's on the outside? Of the, or yeah, I mean, norm. I mean, it's it's up to the agent. Um, it does say inside, so I I don't personally. I don't but a window to me is a window. It doesn't say just the inside of the window, it says windows. If I'm the bias agent, I fill out the contract and I could very well say, uh, shall have the entire property professional cleaning and then maybe put into the special terms, shall include or does not to not does not have to include um, right. things like exterior pressure washing or Shall include um, yeah. screens and the windows or be more specific. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be good because the, the problems occur and they can get emotional, right? When there's a misunderstanding between parties and one guy feels that they're trying to be taken advantage of, and all of a sudden people get pissed off. Yeah. And then it just turns sour right at the end when everyone should be happy, right? Yeah. I mean, I think to your point, if you're going to check that box, Make it clear so the buyer understands what you're asking for and seller understands so that they can comply. Put it in the special terms. You know, keep the cleaning in there. Maybe, um, you know, delete that one section where it says clean the entire exterior. But in the special terms, you can put, you know, refer to, refer to J9. So to have exterior windows and screens professionally cleaned. Okay, we have one minute. Last one. Pet related treatment. Seller, seller, seller shall at seller's expense remove any pets from the property. And after carpets have been professionally shampooed, percent to J9, have the interior of the property treated for please takes by a licensed pest control operator. If seller does not have the property treated, or please takes by a licensed pest control operator as required, then seller agrees that an amount equal to 150% of the estimated cost of treating the property for please takes by a licensed pest control operator shall be held in escrow until completed. Provided, however, that any remaining funds held be automatically dis dispersed to buyer by escrow if the property is not treated for please takes by a licensed pest control operator within X days after closing. All licensed pest control operator treatment shall be paid through escrow and any balance remaining after completion of property I mean, That's you. Uh, a professional treatment shall be returned to seller. So on this one. So keep in mind, if you have, if you're selling a house that has, uh, you know, pets and they have fleas, that's a, that's a two treatment thing. They have to come in treat once. And then because there are eggs that I just haven't hatched yet and they're going to hatch within a week and then they have to come back out. And, you know, there are going to be some buyers, agents, and I would recommend you guys do the same with your buyer's agent where if they have fleas, ticks, whatever, I would request the seller not only treat the interior, but also treat the exterior as well. And, you know, a, a lot of sellers will say, yeah, no problem, we'll do it. It just costs a few hundred bucks more. Yeah. Yeah, because you would have to see the dog scratching itself, no? Like, how would you know that the well, you're walking through and the time that you do a inspection to take their animal with them. Yeah. You know, yeah, but if it's got fleas and you're walking around the house, you're gonna be getting bit. They'll be jumping all over you. Then you have to prove that I got bit when I was in this house. If you, if, you, if you walk out, if there's three people in there and you all got flea bites, then, you know, more than likely. I think it's more of a courtesy out, thing yeah. that. Well, they yeah. had an animal, right? And so maybe they didn't have any, any ticks or fleas, yeah. but you check that box. I mean, so you know, today. They, they, got a, they got a pet tree. Yeah. I mean, today pets are like kids, right? Yeah. So it's like, you know, so they're not going to yeah. go and hide their, yeah. their pets. To get away from trying to fleek for trees. <laughs> I mean, fleas. So, should this be done before the final one? 
Uh, well, it says after the shampoo, which would be after carpet shampoo. So it should be, yeah, at least by the final walkthrough. And if it's not done, you know, the remedy is that they just withhold funds. And that way the buyer gets to decide on what, you know, what company they want to use. And, you know, I don't know if the materials that they, that they throw down are, are toxic or not. They may have little kids and they may not, they may want to choose, you know, what, um, how it's treated. So that took us a whole two hours. Any questions? It did. It's the devil's in the details, right? So this today is three, right? Day three. Mm -hmm. Okay, so two more and lunch on the last one. <laughs> I don't know. I think it's going to be three. I don't know if we're going to get. Depends on how fast we go. What do you mean three? We're on the third one already. How many? We today is day day five. Oh, it's five. Oh, yeah. Okay. Five. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and we got nine. Yeah, I think we. I can think we can so get. Through. Survey is a good one. Yeah. Um. Termite is a good one. Condo docs good one. Well, just in case, just plan on just plan on two thirty for the last day. Okay. And I'll put that. I'll I'll have them do the flyer. Yeah. No, we'll get to it. We'll get to it.